Welcome everyone to Senate Education, Wednesday, January 31st. We are returning to S220 uh, and in act relating to Vermont Public Libraries. Nice to have you here again. Uh, and if you want to, Catherine, kick us off with any response, anything you want to say, any amendments, any suggestions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very happy to, to return to the Senate Education Committee. Um, and I'm going to provide some feedback on behalf of the Department of Libraries. Right. Do we um, have it written also? You you do have um, not every word of it, but a pared down version, Great. which I reference uh, the specific um, language in the bill. Uh, so my name is Catherine Delnao. I'm the state librarian and the commissioner of the Department of Libraries. Our thought collectively is that um, I'll share the department's perspective and there are also folks here from the Vermont School Library Association and the Vermont School Library Association and the Vermont Library Association, each of which have slightly different perspectives um, and different focuses from the department who will also provide feedback and then um, we would be happy to answer questions. Um, so the department appreciates the strong support of, S of the senators, let me start over. <laughs> the department appreciates the strong support that the bill's proponents have offered to libraries in Vermont. And many aspects of the bill, um, S220, relate to the recommendations of the working group on the status of libraries in Vermont directly. Those recommendations were based on more than two years of listening to the community. And the working group's membership included, included leaders both from the Vermont Library Association and from the Vermont School Library Association. I provided you with a document um, that you have access to, which outlines the department's position on each element of S220, and I'll review key points of that document with you now. The department offers its strong support for amending statute to require that all public libraries adopt policies for the selection and reconsideration of materials that complies with the First Amendment, the Civil Rights Act, and state laws prohibiting discrimination in places of public accommodation. The department has a kind of a footnote here. There is a bill that is moving in the House, like through the House. That I'm going to for one moment. And it looks like Morgan, the senators are going to get a new copy. So why don't you give everybody a copy? Unless it's in our folders today. Uh, I, I'm sorry, well, 220. Oh, oh, 220. Great. Thank you. Um, there is a bill related to school library collection development and reconsideration policies that I want to draw to your attention. It's in the House, it's House Bill 807. And the, these two bills um, are similar and seem to relate to one another. And the department would recommend that if possible, the legislature align the language in both bills. And the department's preference is the language in this bill um, related to collection development and reconsideration of materials. The department is generally supportive of amending statute to empower the department to develop model policies for public libraries. Then library boards around the state could choose to adopt those policies that are model policies wholesale, or they could revise them to meet the needs of their local communities. So we really look at collection development and reconsideration policies at the local matter. We're happy to provide guidance to libraries though about best practices. So we are supportive of the model policy um, variants of the bill. We're also very supportive of an amendment to statute that would require the department to adopt a collection development policy. We have an existing collection de development policy, which we were already in the process of updating it, and we are happy to update it so that it reflects diversity of race, ethnicity, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, and disability status, and Vermont's diverse people in history. Just a note on this, that that language aligns with statute related to the state curators collection development policy that already exists. The department offers its strong support for amending statute to lower the age of confidentiality of public library records from 16 years of age to 12 years of age. This change would align the age of confidentiality in public libraries with the age at which youth may make medical decisions on matters of drug and alcohol abuse treatment and mental health treatment independently already. What in section are you on? I am on page nine, line seven. Um, and we have your written response here. So mm -hmm. looking at your written response, your testimony. In the you, written response, yep. I am on the top of page two. Yep. 
Yep, got it. Got it? Okay, great, great. Uh, probably best to stick to your written testimony. Okay. This document. So to read this rather than... Yeah, I think it? so. I mean... Okay. Uh, it's going in the same order. As long as it's in the same it's order, the same yeah, order. great. Because we just don't have a copy yet in front of us, so... Okay. Just know that. Like, Understood. Okay. I can also share my written version of it. Be great. After. Um, so let's see. So section seven. Section seven. Um, the department supports Governor Scott's fiscal year 2025 budget, which does not include the positions enumerated in this section. Um, on training and education for library staff. The department uh, supports the um, inclusion of an obligation, changing a word may to a word shall, related to continuing education for library directors and library staff and statute. Uh, we also welcome addition, we welcome language that would empower the department to provide the certificate in public librarianship program for library directors. We already do that work, but it would be good to have that in statute. Um, Just an aside here, if you look on, if you flip forward slightly um, to page four, number four, establish continuing education requirements for public library trustees. This is also a continuing education topic. The department is not in favor of this addition to statute. Um, we already offer public library. So you just direct us to this. I am, okay. yeah, page four. Okay. Number four at the top. Got it. Yes, thank you, and thanks for slowing me down. <laughs> um, the department currently offers training for public library trustees and will happily continue to do so. Adding requirements about that might be more appropriate to embed in statute related to trustees and their roles and responsibilities. Um, the department has not had success in getting all of the 935 library trustees to take our regular trainings. And I think it would be quite challenging to make sure that they show up for trainings and to track their compliance with that statute. Um, moving back to the public safety section on page two, the department supports the amendment to criminal threatening, which already pertains in municipal public libraries. The update would appropriately provide enhanced protections to those in incorporated public libraries. The department doesn't have an opinion at this time on a proposed amendment related to the possession of a dangerous or deadly weapon in a public library setting. The department plans to research this topic more thoroughly as it questions the constitutionality of the proposed change given that public libraries are public facilities. So then looking at library governance, which is the next subject at the bottom of page two, the department generally supports these amendments to library governance um, and has provided some language that might improve clarity in the sections, uh, clarifying that the public library board adopt policies. Right now, it has language related to directors, which people might think are the library directors, even though we know that the intention is the board of directors, the trustees. It's important to note that 30% of public libraries in Vermont are not, in, not municipal public libraries, and that this section, um, my understanding is that this section on library governance is specific to municipal public libraries and would not have any impact on incorporated public libraries. Could you just make that distinction for me? Sure. In Vermont, there are two types of public libraries. Yeah. They both provide the same service, and when you're in your community, you may not even know what the governance structure is of your public library. For example, here in Montpelier, our public library is the Kellogg Hubbard Public Library. I believe they are an incorporated public library. They receive municipal appropriations, but they are an incorporated entity, a non a nonprofit public library. So in statute of ground public libraries, there's a section about public libraries, and there is the first section at the top is about incorporated public libraries, and the second is about municipal public libraries. The way that this is revised would only impact the specific sections and lines that are cited in this bill would only impact municipal public libraries and would not make a difference about 
with relation to the establishment maintenance for um, the appropriations for the trustees that are, so the bill is, I'm just focusing that attention because you might otherwise not be aware of that distinction. Um, the department's files show that approximately 70% of the public libraries are municipal and about 30% are incorporated. And they do provide the same service. They both provide free service. And it's really just a matter of how they were originally incorporated. Uh, or, uh, yeah. Yeah. And the incorporated public library is not a part of municipal government, but typically receives municipal appropriations through town meeting. Um, moving on to the section on the Department of Libraries. Um, Section 15. The department is in favor of the amendment to section 606. Um, the department has some questions about the legislators, the legislature's goals with this section and what the impacts would be for public libraries if they didn't comply with minimum standards established by the department. Um, there are currently minimum standards from 1986 that the department had established, and they are all recommended. The department's perspective is that if we're simply making recommendations, then the rulemaking process may not be necessary, and it may actually get in the way of our work with our regular library community. We're happy to develop model policies. We're happy to set some benchmarks or baselines based on tiers. We like that approach, but rulemaking is a somewhat cumbersome process. Right. And um, so we're wondering if there's another way to address this, since most of what the bill is addressing is really a recommendation. And since the aspects related to collection development are covered in another section of the bill. So that we would we would say it might be a, a more simple approach to just empower us to set the model policies, to adopt model policies and to, to establish some recommendations of service levels by tiers. So um, that's section five you're talking about, all the duties? Section 16. Hmm? Section 16. 16. On page three under the Department of Libraries. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I covered everything. Um, I wanna call out something on the first page of my um, handout to you, which is around the, the licensing of electronic literary content. Products. This is a very complex topic, mm -hmm. and I'm frankly having trouble understanding the implications and what would happen if this bill were passed in this way. Um, I think that the bill would definitely have impacts for our contracts at the Department of Libraries and potentially for public libraries, school libraries, academic libraries all around the state. And I don't understand exactly how that would play out over time. When um, the working group made its recommendation, we really were thinking about access. We want to increase access, and we know that costs, that funding is tight everywhere, and Vermonters want to keep their tax rates low, and we know that um, it's hard for us to buy books and to buy electronic resources, too. Um, we're really, the firm's very concerned that if we move quickly on this legislation, we might have some unintended consequences, and we would encourage a little bit of a slower roll on this so that we really think about it in terms of what's the intent that we have, and maybe could, the, could our legislators and others in the region, other states, do things in concert. Vermont has a really small market share, and to be frank, I'm a little concerned that publishers would just not sell to us. And that some language in this bill makes me wonder if they didn't sell to us at the same price as the public consumer, would people like Chair Campion who uses Audible, would you be impacted? I right. don't actually know. It's most important. Yeah. <laughs> we want to keep your access to ebooks <laughs> strong. So yeah, our, no, I really appreciate you raising it. We have uh, Mr. Sherman in the room who's going to come in next week to represent the industry and have a conversation with us about that. And I yeah. also concerned about what the unintended consequences. Yes, and sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, as a co-lead sponsor of this bill, I, I agree that this is a very complicated area. Um, so I would not be opposed to removing it, but I would all, I'd have to discuss it with the other lead sponsor. But could you possibly suggest some 
language that focuses strictly on access, which is really, it sounds like that's what you're looking for. So could um, you suggest it, language? I think potentially, yes. Okay. I think that what's really important is that we want to ensure that Vermonters have access to these materials, ebooks, e audio books, and also our digital databases, our online databases that include um, digitized books right. often. So we want to be sure that we have that. I think that the concern is really that the industry has two different price points and that we're rebuying books again and again and again, which really is impacting our collections budgets and kind of putting the squeeze on librarians. So I think the department supports any way we can improve that dynamic and would encourage our colleagues in the industry to really consider that. Um, yeah, my sense is that this is this is a world that's going to keep changing and morphing and evolving, and so we have to sort of stay, you know, supple and how we react to it as well. So, okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Would you mind sharing just a little bit what's happening right now in libraries as it relates to this? Do you remind? I actually think it might be good to okay, hear from right, a library, right, right, okay. one of the libraries right. themselves, and I know that some of my colleagues are prepared to speak to that. Terrific. I just want to, um, I just want to share one thing, and I forgot to include it in my notes about uh, Chair Campion, you had asked me, what does this bill miss? And there's an important thing related to the work of the Department of Libraries. The, the working group recommended, and I will provide you with my written notes, and I will update okay, this great. for you. Um, there is an important aspect of statute related to the department that says that the department shall be the primary access point for state information and provide advice on state information technology policy. Um, the working group recommended that because we now have 211, we now have the internet, the other departments, the legislature, nobody comes to the Department of Libraries asking us to review the information architecture or what's on your web pages, that this is really outdated and we it could be removed with no impact to information to the state and would align better with our staffing levels and our capacity and no one would have this expectation. I, of course, would be happy to continue to serve on any board and provide technical assistance as I always have, but um, this this bit of statute doesn't align with today. This is a simple statute. Which statute is that? It is, um, it's not on here at all, but it's chapter 22, section 606. I didn't even know about it. No. Nobody does. <laughs> and when I can't find things on the, that are parts of the state's information, I always, you know, note that I wouldn't have done it that way. I think I made a comment to my colleagues about that yesterday. Center weeks. Oh, thanks. I'm just curious. So my understanding is the bill is essentially re in reaction to the library study that was conducted. Was that an element of the library study? Was that did that come out of the findings? It was. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's on. To such a reason why that wasn't included. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's on page 23 of the working group um, report. Yeah, no, party. Party. yeah, it was just a suggestion to remove it from statute. And I think I, I do want to say before I pass things over to my colleagues that uh, I do really appreciate the attention that Senator Gulick and Senator Hardy have paid to the recommendations of the working group. Uh, the library community engaged in a very in-depth process over two years, and as the chair of that body, I have to say it is really meaningful that you are listening, that you are trying to help us to provide the best service that we can to public libraries, academic and school libraries in the state, and we really appreciate this opportunity to share with you areas where what seem to be pretty minor changes could have a significant impact, so I appreciate your time today. I live right here in town. I'm happy to come back to talk about this fall, anything in more depth that's in the bill. But I, my colleagues who came from further away, I want to move off this. Any kind of questions for uh, Ms. Gilnado? Thanks a million. Of course. Thank you. Hey, want to come up, Oshan? Yeah. So nice to see you. Could you just uh, please come up from Bennington today? Yeah, well, lovely to be here. Thank you all so much. Um, for the I'm Oceana Wilson. I'm the president of the Vermont Library Association and the dean of the library at Bennington College. Um, I will pick up on what we just talked about, which was um, electronic literary products. So page five and seven, section 162 and 163. Uh, the Vermont Library Association is very concerned about the importance of ebooks and e audio to Vermonters. 
he's playing a critical role in providing access, given the ruralness of Vermont and winter travel. For many of our people, being able to access these books and audio online are essential. It also plays a significant role in vulnerable populations, such as vision impairment and um, early and, and helps with early and reluctant readers at a young age. Often audio is seen as, as an entry wagon. So while we um, are grateful for the attention in this bill and believe it's important, we would also um, ask that there be a pause in that we're not sure this legislation as written will have the effect and the impact um, that we are looking for. So we are in agreement with the Vermont um, Department of Library Group. Um, and the second, uh, and uh, also um, Mary, the Vice President of BLA is going to share further. So I'm doing part of the BLA response and she'll do further. Um, the Vermont Library Association would like to express very strong support for section 67, Public Library Statement of Policy Use of Facilities on page seven, and section 69, Public Library Section and Consideration of Library Materials, page eight. I would like to extend appreciation to Senator Hashim for reaching out on behalf of his constituencies, raising the concerns that we are seeing across the country in attempts to censor and um, challenge material. 2023 was the highest rating of book challenges in, in the past 20 years as recorded by the American Library Association. Um, and we're starting to see similar increases in programming challenges. We feel that these two sections provide very strong and clear support that libraries must act within um, the Civil Rights Act, the First Amendment. The freedom to read for all Vermonters is so essential that we cannot allow a voice or single group of voices to decide for individuals what they want to read and what they want to think. And we feel that that's a very strong and important protection. And we are very grateful for the addition to this. Um, our colleagues at the SLA, the Vermont School Library Association, and um, the Vermont Library Association recently issued a Vermont Freedom to Read statement based on the insurance that all Vermonters can exercise this fundamental freedom. So we're very grateful for those additions and strongly support that. Thank you. Great. Oh, any questions? Oh, sorry. Ms. Wilson. Good. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Mary, is it Danko? It's Mary Danko, yeah. Great. And I'm the director at the Fletcher Free Library in Burlington, Vermont. Great. But I do want to say I was also the director at the Weathersfield Proctor Library in Vermont, which was 856 square feet. And I was a one-person librarian there, and I was also the librarian in Heartland, Vermont. Oh. It was a small library. So I feel like I have good experience across different size libraries. Um, and Ms. Dango, did somebody tell you that this is a tough committee? Yes. Yeah, the, that the, is nice just not, not the group. Like no. the nicest group of people. <laughs> I'm shaking in my you boots know, right I, now. I, I heard he may have said something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he did. Tell I mean, we're tough in a good way. But yeah. Just, yeah. He said he was a real library supporter, though. And he, he is a real library supporter. <laughs> he is a real library supporter. He remembers he's terrific. bringing yeah. internet to libraries a long time ago. Yes, he's taking credit for all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for... Yeah. Um, uh, I'm excited like, you're here. I'm so glad to be here. And just grateful for all the hard work with the working group and the bill. And there's a lot here. There was just a couple things I wanted to speak to. And one was on um, Section 172, which was the confidentiality uh, piece and lowering the age to 12. We are so in favor of lowering that age for a variety of reasons. Um, personally, I'm going to sometimes put on my Fletcher Free Library hat when as Fletcher Free Library Director. Um, I would even love it to be lower. I think as Oceana was saying, we really believe in the freedom to read and we trust the reader. And we know that um, children as young as eight, nine, and 10 are sometimes getting material from the library that has been curated by library professionals 
um, that has great meaning and impact as, on their lives. Some of these children are going through really tough times. They are really struggling. And credible, vetted information that's provided by their public library in a private way is in, in, very, very important to them. So I hope this is a section that we continue to look at. And um, the Intellectual Freedom Committee, which is part of the Vermont Library Association, has not had a chance to weigh fully in on this, but we are um, digging deeper with them. So, Ms. Daniel, tell us what this would do that's not happening right now by the age. Right now, if a parent came in and a child who was 15 had a book out that said something like, maybe the topic was about incest or sexual abuse, or maybe it's just something like their parents are going through a divorce, mm -hmm. or they think their parents are going through a divorce, there's a, a wide range, their parent could ask to see their library record. I see. So um, the mom could come in and say, I want to know what my son Johnny's been taking out. And we have to provide that information. It's not, it's not private for them. By lowering the age, their record is private. Senator, thanks, sir. What's the current age? It's 16. And I may be wrong, but Ms. Delano, Delano, last week, or when you were in here last, uh, did you say that in some states it's, there is no age? Is that accurate? That is like, correct. Like, Okay. Yes, there are a number of states with no age listed at all. Okay. The working group had a lot of discussion on this topic, and um, ultimately consensus was around lowering it to 12 because of specific legislation in Vermont related to alcohol abuse treatment and substance abuse treatment, which children who are 12 years of age and older can make autonomous decisions. They can independently make decisions about going to the doc, going to a medical professional and getting help for those conditions. And also, um, also, I'm trying to think of, I'm missing one more topic, but there are, there's medical abuse treatment, substance abuse treatment, and STDs, STD treatment, um, and um, and also topics like if they were, went, went in and their a child was in the terrible situation of being in an abusive relationship and they were making reproductive decisions. Uh, those things are all, all ready enshrined in statute. And so um, lowering the age to 12 to align with that seemed like it would be a, a good match because if the child can make a decision, we want them to make an informed decision using vetted resources, not just Googling it and hoping for the best with the information that they get. Um, the information from the public library would be uh, of a higher quality, would be selected by professionals, would be factual. Um, and to, answer, to just mention for those who weren't here last week, um, one of the senators had, you had mentioned something about the databases. When we have database contracts in libraries, um, that information is typically not available to other people, but the child, if they logged in with their library card, um, their safe searches and things like that could be seen by their parents. So I just wanted to add that qualification around the database searching. Okay. The American Library Association has a whole page and it has all the different state statutes on it. But yes, there are many states that have no age limit at all. Case time, is there average age or median age or something like that? I mean, you know, to reference a few states that have none, I'm just curious what, what the other side is. I would have to I would have to do that research um, this morning. I think I've looked at uh, California, Maine, and Montana all have no ages. I believe New Hampshire, I'm sorry. And New Hampshire, Hampshire. I believe and New Hampshire. Hampshire. Oh, thank you. I worked in New Hampshire. I should know that. Yes. Yeah. Massachusetts. I believe Massachusetts as well. It's a good intern project. I need to go to that. The other topic is section 4004, which is about adding libraries and not having weapons on site. Um, we have not had enough chance, I think, as an association to delve in on this. I think um, some of us that are in uh, more urban environments would welcome this. I think some places that are in more rural environments are not quite sure. What I will say that I think we're gra grateful for is that the working group heard that safety is an issue in public libraries right now. Um, I did, I think I'm a little late in sharing some of the stats that um, I brought from Fletcher Free Library, but we are seeing an increase of 
um, incidents where we are trespassing people, we have a very robust ordinance. And the, depending on the egregiousness of the behavior, we can trespass someone. And it's just gone through the roof. Um, people are in, as you know, in in challenging situations and they are um, acting out in ways that is just not appropriate and we're trying to keep our staff safe and we're trying to keep the other people using the library that is safe. Um, so thinking about those things in terms of how we can help keep libraries safe is something we really want to keep working at. Uh, and I would say, am I able to say something that's not on here? Sure. Okay. Well, yeah. I guess yeah. the, the one thing that um, public libraries don't have is sustainable funding. And I know that's not so much in your purview on this bill, but it's something that when I have a chance at this table, I would like to bring it up. And something specific that has really been highlighted over the past year is funding for our capital projects, our improvements, our remodeling, and even new libraries. Um, and we've gotten some great ARPA money that's coming down that the wonderful Department of Libraries is going to be um, giving out through a grant process. But as they will tell you, when they did the needs assessments for what our libraries need, they're not going to even make it with the $25 million that you're set to give away between the two, the two funding sources that are coming. So how that would help us is if we knew there was reliable funding for these capital projects, that would free up money for us to take care of our safety needs, to take care of our collection needs, because we wouldn't be so worried about the maintenance and upkeep of our basic infrastructure. So it would be really great to build and improve on the wonderful start that we have with this funding that's coming. Um, Massachusetts does a great job of it. They, they've set aside that funding. They have uh, linked it with lead fund, lead, um, Certification yeah. as well. Yeah. So when we, these projects come on, there's yeah. somebody at the table that's saying make it sustainable as well. So that, that's my parting gift to all. I appreciate it. Uh, we're struggling also as, as construction issues with our schools. So many buildings in this state. Um, we just want a little bit of online gambling money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming with actually a source. <laughs> well, I, I will yeah. tell you when we when we see yeah. that things that come down the path yeah. that are have addictive qualities to them, mm -hmm. and then then really start to have impacts on our social, you know, social service structures. Yeah. I the library is there. Mm -hmm. We're the ones that are seeing these folks that are then down and out because of this stuff. Yeah. So I, I, to me, there is a, a, yeah. a relationship. I appreciate you saying that as well. I, I think, I just speaking for myself, I'm not in libraries as much as I used to be. I'm sure that's true with a lot of, a lot of people. Um, and you forget that, yes, indeed, there are so many resources in there and that people who are in need of some mental, social, physical support arrive there at your doorstep as well. So, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dippertz, uh, is that correct? Yes, yeah, thank you. Great. And just, you know, we're doing okay. We have about 20 plus minutes. Great, right, thank you. Uh, Not just for you. Oh, <laughs> in my case, I'll keep it brief. Um, thank you all for having us here today and talk about this ST20. My name is Charles DeBritz. I'm a middle school librarian in Burlington. It is my ninth year as a librarian and my 22nd as an educator, mostly in the state. Uh, it's also my third year at the executive board of Mount School Library Association. I'm here with our co president. Um, if you're not already aware, we're the uh, professional organization for school librarians. We have about 200 members uh, in the state. Uh, we want to thank the working group and all the work that they did and for the proposals in this work. And I should also point out, Senator Gulick is a former librarian as well. Not only a teacher, and a school yeah, board member. Yeah, the school board. Yeah. Are you going to yes. uh, We haven't celebrated Senator Gulick enough today. We just want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, So thank you. Thank, thank you so much for doing that. And we have a couple of uh, provisions that we like to speak of from the library, school library point of view. Uh, the first is not in our rank comments, but it was mentioned, and that's in relation to uh, House Bill 807, which is about material selection policies in school libraries. And the Vermont School Library Association supports that <laughs> language that has this written, and we would hope that as it comes together, uh, it is different because that is about 
working with our school boards and the language in here is for our public library. So uh, I think they mirror each other, but they could be different, probably should be different. Um, uh, other provisions specifically to S220 that we like to talk about, or at least reference, and I've read comments about ebooks, not ebooks. And we don't know specifically if this is the answer to that. And I wrote in my comments about some of the challenges that schools specifically face because of that. But we would hope that yeah. any cop the legislature can provide in this area would impact us schools and public libraries and all of us, not just like one piece of the library world. Um, so that just something that we're looking forward to eventually. Uh, the second area that may be the most important for us is the addition of school library consultant position in the agency of education and so on the bill page nine, section seven. Uh, this is something we believe again could have a tremendous impact on the Vermont school libraries. This type of position existed in Vermont for many decades, actually from the late 1960s up to the uh, early 2000s. And um, I outlined some of the things that the position formally did for us uh, as a consultant. That was a little before my time in the library, but we recognized the value that that position had. And especially uh, having the library advocate in the Department of Education was instrumental in establishing the requirement in 1999-2000 educational quality standards that every Vermont school has a library. And we're fortunate to live in Market State that recognizes the importance of school librarians. And my colleague and vice president, sorry, co-president, uh, Rebecca Sofferman, will talk a little bit more about the importance of that position for us, what we think that could do, and for our school libraries. Thank you very much for sure. this. Um, I have a question about that, because we, we generally like to look at what's happening in the AOE and get an understanding of what's going on there and what their capacity is, resources, et cetera. I know there is no dedicated position as liaison. Um, is there someone else, though, in the AOE that is sort of a go-to person for school librarians? I, When I was a librarian, I don't remember that, but I wonder if you... you um, with the lack of this position, we reached out to the AOE in adoption for our uh, school library standards, which have not been adopted yet, but we're hoping to be adopted. And we have a liaison, well, not in the way that this position would be created, but someone that we meet with, uh, Lisa Allen, the oh. AOE. Uh, and she's great, but her background is not in libraries. What's uh, that Is it help? Help. Okay. Uh, the, the position, although it's not created, like the way that we envision some of the things that you do, uh, that's a lot more than, than they, I think, have the position as well. Great. Any final questions? Did I cut you off? No, for sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to pass it off to Rebecca. All right. Soften it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Rebecca Sofferman. Thank you so much for having us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I've been, I'm librarian at Colchester Middle School, and I'm co president of the Mosque uh, School Library Association. I've been a librarian for 15 years. Um, the first seven of those were in New York State. And in New York, they have these, um, they're called um, Board of Cooperative Education Services. And it is like a regional kind of cooperative that they share all kinds of services. And one, each of those regions has a library director. So in my early years as a librarian, I had this position that was, you know, they supported new, li new librarians. Was, it was incredible as a new librarian to have somebody to support you. And they also provided a lot of services. I'm going to outline what some of those things would be for our position. But it was a similar kind of a thing as what we're talking about. When I came to Vermont um, eight years ago, back to Vermont, but, um, I really miss that. And I've missed it ever since because um, we, we don't have that specific support. And we, you know, I, I don't want to discount the Department of Libraries and how, how you know, helpful the Department of Libraries is. Um, but it is, school librarians are, the school library is a little bit different in the way that we work, and um, specifically that we we also are teachers, and so we are really governed under the um, agency of education. So having somebody specifically in that agency will be really really critical. And when we um, when we met with Lisa Hill um, after the working group report came out, she asked us, "What is the number one thing out of here that would benefit you or we hands down? You know, this this position of a a library consultant. Um, one of the reasons why that Sorry. was a, 
Uh, library consultant, you're talking within the eight? Uh, within the eight. Within the eight, 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 okay. Yes, I'm not talking about the voice system. Yeah, no, I just, that, that that's the number one yeah, thing. Yeah, that's the number one thing for the school library. Yeah, that I'm sure, felt like sure. was really coming from the whole report. So we were so happy to see that still um, as, as the really critical thing. So in, in for school libraries, we're usually the only person in our building that does what we do. We're the only person who talks about the It's very common to be the only one been in our district sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't as much um, you know, support as maybe other teachers have for their discipline and for all their, their needs. Um, uh, districts in more rural parts of the state are finding it difficult to fill library positions right now. And um, teachers and community members without library training are being put into those roles in many, very frequently. And they're expected to just start running the library right away. And they are usually um, immediately enrolled in the, um, the UVM um, courses to get their certification. That's a two-year process that they have to go through. So, sorry, so that's two years full-time? No. No, no they take the it, course take classes. Time. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. you end up with a master's degree? Yeah. Or is it it's a certification? It's just a certification. Okay. So what's happening is frequently it's somebody who's maybe a teacher in that school. Yeah. They can't fill the position. They ask somebody to come into that role and they just have no no library background at all. Um, they have the education background, but they don't have any library, which is you know not not the same. Um, and so it's really hard for for these people. But and that's just sort of one example for the new librarians. Um, so a lot of the um, provisions in in S um, two twenty pertain more to school libraries, but or to uh, public libraries. But for us, this. We recognize this as by those who are in mission to have a school library consultant. So these are some duties that we came up with that we think that could be beneficial not just to new librarians, but to all school librarians. Um, one of them would be to facilitate the adoption of our standards, which came out in 2018. These are national standards. Um, I don't know, if, I'm sure you're aware as an education community, but all disciplines have their own sets of standards that they have to abide by um, that guide how they teach, what they teach, how they teach in their discipline. So these are our standards for our discipline. Um, and so these have not yet been adopted. Um, Vermont students consequently don't have equitable access to learning these information literacy skills. Um, the position can protect students' freedom to read by making sure all school districts have updated library selection policies and reconsideration of materials procedures guided by the um, intellectual freedom policies from the American Library Association and the Vermont Freedom to Read Statement. Yes, Please. that is in the bill, though, correct? This language, isn't this, isn't this in the bill? Right. Um, and I want to, I want to um, reiterate kind of what Charles said in that um, school libraries have a slightly different way that those challenges would would come into play, and and the way that that would impact schools because we have school boards. I know libraries have library boards, but like the, the language of H807 is very specific to schools and how things would kind of proceed in this school library um, setting in a district uh, when those challenges happen. I do agree that it's important in all libraries to have those zero selection policies. So if there is a way to kind of align the language and still keep the, you know, the specific language that has to do with school boards, I, I think that it's, it's all important if, it, if it's helpful and how more powerful to have that combined than that. Um, then the next thing would be like assess school library program assessments, assessing how well your programs are going, um, negotiating um, license agreements to provide consortium pricing um, for things like ebooks, audiobooks, video streaming, subscription databases new sources and library catalog systems. Some of that currently is coming through the Department of Libraries, but they can't always provide mm -hmm. um, everything that the schools need. For example, right now we are um, we have the, a, a public performance license, which kind of covers schools for um, against copyright violations when we show movies. Um, it, it's not considered necessarily automatically always fair use to show a movie in school. So having that performance license is really important to protect schools from any kind of litigation. And um, we at the Department of Libraries was able to help with consortium pricing in the past, but they're not able to do that anymore. 
So that means that that license, which is so important in schools, is currently something that schools are going to have to potentially face on their own. Um, and that the, the cost is, is cost prohibitive for a lot of schools, especially the smaller ones. So having our own representative to be able to negotiate things that are that are um, pertaining to school libraries specifically is really important. Um, ensuring that schools adhere to the um, education quality standards in regards to library staffing and safety. Um, not all districts right now have um, their library positions all filled, partly because they can't always find people, so it's not always a you know intentional thing, it's an unintentional thing, but having somebody to be able to really um, look out for that and be, you know, paying attention and following through when we be. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ensuring students, all right, so I'm wondering if that, that seems like it would be something that the AOE would do. And that's another issue that comes up every once in a while in this committee is um, what is the AOE's responsibility in terms of enforcement and support? Because those two sort of go together. Um, so that is, that gives us something to think about. Um, and it really, again, ties into the capacity of the AOE. Yeah, and we when we met with Lisa Helm the last time, when we met with her project just a couple of times and brought up a couple of school districts that we had some concerns about, and they said that they were going to follow up, but for somebody, she does not have the time to be chasing that, you know, not so much chasing it down, but keeping tabs on everybody. It's, it's you know, and we don't either necessarily, right. you know, and we're trying to do that just in our capacity as co-presidents. Um, but it would be it'd be really helpful to have uh, somebody who could really be on top of that. That is your list. It does. Thank you. But I am going to just follow up and I'll be done with my questions for you. But um, I'm loving all of these suggestions that yeah. I want you to finish for sure. I'm just wondering <clears throat> in terms of us getting these into a bill, if they would make more sense in the House in the in the H807 or in this one. And we can think about that, but I just wanted to put that out there. And I don't want to speak for no, Rebecca, okay. but we feel like these are examples of things that that position, if it was added, could do. And we'd be right. happy to work with the AOE to say, here are some of the things we need. Yeah. Uh, we're just kind of outlining how that position could be beneficial to our students. Right. Like, I'm not sure each of these need to be written into a bill, legislated, but as you're thinking about the, the importance of this position, mm -hmm. this is why. Thank this is why I'm yeah, especially thank because you. we know it costs money. <laughs> right, right. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, um, sort of collaborating with the UVM graduate program that currently is providing, as I mentioned, that licensing and, um, and a certification pro program for new librarians. So it's a it's six courses that they take to be certified as information from you know a teaching background um, from you know there's different pathways, but. Um, and so right now, um, Charles and I both teach actually in that in over in that um, sorry in that sequence. And right now there's 40 students in the cohort, so we we're really hopeful. This is exciting. It's a good thing that we're finding more people that want to be librarians, and we're hoping that maybe they can help fill some of those holes, those gaps that are in these um, school libraries that can't fill uh, positions. Um, but helping to coordinate that, working with UVM to coordinate that and maybe help those students find their way to the libraries that <clears throat> people would be another thing that that person could do. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you could just sort of wrap up just because we yeah. do have more witnesses on this, Absolutely. so we've got a shift, I'm afraid. Um, <clears throat> then the only other two things were helping coordinate our mentoring program, which is already in place, and supporting, again, school librarians that might be going under, undergoing challenges. So, you know, again, not to not to discount the help of the um, department libraries, but you can see that there's there are things that the AOE can do because we are under the realm of the yeah. department. We're teachers, so we're governed by the Department of Education. That requires a slightly different thing. And just to echo what Senator Kulik said, we're concerned, or I think several of us are concerned with the agency of education and the lack of capacity it has right now. And, this is just uh, one example, and we'll see between our conversations with the administration and our president of appropriations, we can advance some of these positions going forward. Thank you. Particularly, I'd say around Dr. Sarah Fields, we have enforcement. 
Oh, Any final questions before we uh, shift to Ms. Cook? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cook online. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can oh. hear you, but we don't see you yet. Okay. I don't know why you can't see me. <laughs> okay. Um, um, something on our end, or well, you're short on time, so if you don't mind, I'll just go ahead, voice only. Um, my name is Rebecca Cook. I'm the director of Pulteney Public Library. Uh, I strongly agree with the Department of Libraries and the Vermont Library Association on all the positions they outlined, so I won't waste your time going over any of those. To reiterate, um, I did want to take a moment uh, to speak with you today about page 11, section 10. 4004, Possession of Dangerous or Deadly Weapon in a Public Library. Um, I do agree that library safety is a huge issue these days. It's definitely something we deal with all the time. My concern is that in small and rural libraries uh, where we don't have sufficient public safety, there is not any backup for librarians trying to enforce this law. Uh, Pulteney does not have its own police force. We have an elected constable and we contract some hours with the Rutland County Sheriff's Department. But when I've had to call for police backup in the library, sometimes it's a matter of days before I get help. Um, our emergency plan involves yelling out the side door to the gentlemen in the pickup trucks that hang, up out, hang out outside of Stewart's to come help us. So in that environment, uh, I'm concerned that that leaves library staff to confront armed people and ask them not to be armed in the library, which uh, would in turn make us less safe. I also uh, have concerns about alienating a significant number of our library members who do carry holstered firearms or sheathed knives as a regular part of their daily apparel and who have never posed a security threat, um, but would no longer be welcome in our libraries. So I, I just wanted to kind of reach out and, and share my thoughts on that. Any other comments, Ms. Cook? Um, that that's just the main thing that I'd like to see our small towns get more public safety and to see libraries be a part of that. And then, as you mentioned, uh, otherwise you're you're supportive of the of the bill or of, of what your colleagues have uh, shared today. Yes, um, very much so in regards to um, policies, accessibility. Um, confidentiality, all of that very much on board with, with the Vermont Department of Libraries and the Vermont Library Association. Perfect. You know, you have two great senators on this committee. Hi, Dr. Hello. Thank you for including me. Senator Weeks and Senator Williams. No. no <laughs> uh, any final questions for Ms. Cook? Yes. Uh, Senator Hashim, please. Thank you for the uh, perspective that you provided there. I I appreciate that. I think, um, I guess my question would be, you know, do you have any thoughts on making this rule a sort of opt-in option for libraries? Because librarians and the towns know the people in that town uh, better. And, you know, for example, my librarian in Brattleboro is in very, in very strong support of this because of past incidents and you know it's obviously very different from Paulton. So do you have any opinions on making this an option for librarians or towns to decide upon? Yes, I would love to see this decided um, on a town by town, library by library basis because I do definitely see huge benefits for um, my colleagues in more urban city libraries. Um, it's just, one of the great things about Vermont, but also one of the difficulties is that the 
day-to-day -day life experience in the small towns and in the cities is completely different. Um, and so there really is not a one size fits all answer. Thank you. Great discussion, please. So I have a general question that I believe uh, Captain may be able to address. What's the flow of funding to, to municipal libraries? Is it, or, you know, is there like a split between local taxes, uh, property taxes supporting a library versus state funding or federal funding? How does that work? I would describe it this way. So the funding comes from municipalities up. There is, um, the Department of Libraries provides some grants to public libraries in the state, both municipal and incorporated, to support interlibrary loan, to support some summer programming, but libraries in Vermont are funded at the municipal level and by local funds. Um, some libraries have endowments as well, uh, but there is most public libraries will go in front of their municipality on town meeting day. You'll find library directors across the state engaged that day in making a pitch for their library budgets and hoping that they get support from the municipalities. That's the primary source of funding for public libraries in our state, both incorporated and municipal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you for everything that you do. And this has been a really terrific conversation. I feel like we've made some progress on uh, advancing the bill. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Why don't we just stretch for a minute? We Welcome back to Senate Education. We are now uh, going to shift to Adult Education Literacy Network. This is budget adjustment conversation. So Welcome, and I believe you've both already been to Senate Appropriations, or have you not been to Senate Appropriations? We have oh, not. You have not been to Senate. Yeah. All right. Well, we're thrilled you're here, uh, and look forward to hearing your testimony. All right. And why don't we just, because we don't do it, you do it periodically, just go around and introduce ourselves so you know where we're from, and you can yes. uh, introduce yourselves in a couple of the Okay, so we'll start with Senator Fushim. I'm uh, Larry Fishing from Dumberson, California. Joe Christopher from Long Adult Learning, and I live in North America. Catherine Kostein from Central Vermont Adult Education, and I live in Dayton. Terry Williams from Rowan County, and I live in Rowan County. Dave Weeks representing Rowan County from Parker. Brian Campion, Bennington County. Martine Laurent Gillard for Arlington, uh, Chittenden Central District. And just so the committee knows, I was on the task force with adult literacy this summer. So just that's why I'm strict to know. Yeah, that is. Yeah. And our other advocates and guests. Yep. Meg Post, Action Socials. Yep. Uh, Billy Rice in the uh, University of Vermont. Great. Thanks. Okay. And of course, we have Orca, Finn. Always good to see you. Morgan's over here. Floor is yours. Excellent. Um, so you all should have a printout of a PowerPoint yes. presentation. And I'll just kind of reference some of those slides so I just want to go through that quickly. So we are here before you about a budget adjustment mm -hmm. request. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for allowing us to present to you today on behalf of the Vermont Adult Education and Literacy Network in regards to our fiscal year 24 request for budget adjustments for um, additional funding of $500,000. Our network is comprised, sorry, this is a slide too. Our network is comprised of four adult education and literacy providers in the state, which include Central Vermont Adult Education in the green, the North Northeast Kingdom Learning Services in yellow, the Tutorial Center in pink, and Vermont Adult Learning in blue. We serve the entire state and are able to serve um, students regardless of where they are. <laughs> Our request for an additional $500,000 is a budget adjustment to the $1 million we received as one-time funding in this year's budget. This financial support will keep us out of the red by funding, staffing salaries and benefits, technology needs and software upgrades, hardware, textbooks, supplies, and other instructional materials, and outreach and recruitment. We are extremely grateful for the $1 million in one-time funds, but it does not meet our needs as the cost of business increases and enrollment continues to rise. Slide three, the 2022 U.S. Census Community Survey found that there are around 35,000 out-of-school Vermonters ages 16 and up without a high school diploma. In addition, there are 10,000 more who have a diploma but lack the academic and job readiness skills needed for the most high-demand jobs in Vermont. 
Each year, we open opportunities for thousands of those Vermonters by helping them build the skills they need for better jobs, furthering their education, or, better, or developing new job skills. But revenue from the state has not kept pace with the increase in costs of providing these services. At the same time, the number of Vermonts, Vermonters seeking our services has significantly increased in recent years. We have all heard about the disconnect between the number of jobs available in Vermont and the number of workers available to fill them. We can be a part of the solution, but we need the funding to do it. On slide four, as I mentioned, we're extremely grateful for the one-time funding we've received over the last several years, but it still does not meet our needs and the cost of business has increased and enrollment rises. Your support in providing our request for an additional $500,000 to the AEL network will ensure that we can adequately serve and reach more Vermonters and help them to build the assets they need to take advantage of the many workforce development opportunities in Vermont. Slide five. Our work changes lives. It's really true. If you want to see for yourself, we'd love to have you join one of our graduation ceremonies. They are what keep me going and connect me to the power of our work. There, I hear the stories from students, the stories of their dreams, of the challenges they have overcome, of the AEL staff who believed in them more than they believed in themselves, of their newfound confidence in their ability, of the difference their education is making to their families, and the opportunities for jobs or education they are pursuing. The majority of our students live in poverty, have a disability, identify as a person of color, experience homelessness, or are unemployed. Many are parents with school-age children. Often they come to us lacking the technology, the skills or the recesses to work or learn remotely. More often than not, they face a combination of these barriers. More and more of our students are immigrants. While some of these immigrants never learn to read or write in their own language, others are highly educated professionals, but because they lack the ability to speak, read, and write in English, they end up in low paying manual jobs. What they all have in common is the desire to learn and grow. The AELN helps them do that by providing a full range of services, from learning to speak and read English, to pathways for earning a high school diploma or a GED. On slide six, we have a story of one of our students. In her mid-50s, Wendy came to us with no high school diploma and a body unable to continue to be a barn manager for over a thousand cattle. She says, with the help of my teachers at CBAE, I was able to fill my dream of having a high school diploma as well as get the resources to go into the Allied Health Program at Community College of Vermont. I worked full-time as an LNA while I earned my Allied Health Certificate. Prior to discovering CBAE, I avoided the topic of high school graduations because I hadn't actually graduated from mine. I'm sorry, mine. repeat that last line. She avoided Wait. the topic of high school graduations because she hadn't actually completely graduated from her own high school. So in conversation, or also just would go to people, you know, was just that far? Just came up, wow. with friends, yeah. family. Yeah. Many yeah. of our students say that, like, I never wanted to confess. So yeah. my closest friends don't know that I don't have ice yeah. on. Yeah. My CBA teacher gave me a motivational calendar, which ke I kept for encouragement. Uh, they gave me tools. I challenged myself. I really wanted a diploma, and I made it happen. I didn't stop there. My diploma was a stepping stone to becoming an LNA, then an LPN and an RN, and proud to have become a registered nurse. So Wendy's story just illustrates the value uh, that Vermont's AEL network brings to the workforce development picture. We provide skills, essential assets, and create a viable pipeline to careers. Your investment will allow us to continue that final work. Uh, slide seven. Many of the students we work with are not ready for other educational or training opportunities. We're kind of that first step for them on the pathway. You know, there are a lot of amazing training programs out there already, but if you don't have the basic skills to be successful there, your first stop is adult education. In addition to the academic services we provide, we work closely with students to craft a personal learning plan that connects them with social services to support their educational journey. Once they develop the skills needed, we connect them with the educational and training opportunities to start them on their career path. These opportunities include programs at CTE centers, CCV, and the BSC system. Slide eight. Uh, many Vermont jobs and training opportunities require a high school credential. For Vermonters who drop out of high school or immigrants who never had the opportunity to go to high school, we provide preparation and testing for the GED. We also run a high school completion program. 
Through the HSCP, any Vermonter age 16 or older who does not have a diploma has the opportunity to earn their diploma from a local high school. This not only provides the credential they need for further training or education, but can provide opportunities for career exploration and preparation, often with the CTE centers as part of the work they do in their graduation requirements. Uh, slide nine, Vermont's AELM providers um, provide an excellent value for the money. Our cost per student is close to $3,000. Um, uh, over 140 adults received their high school credentials through us last year, and we funneled more students into college and job training programs. A high percentage of our students come to us either unemployed or with fragile employment, and many find they're getting more consistent employment. Imagine the dent in our workforce shortage if the 30,000 plus without diplomas and the tens of thousands more with low skills were to enter the workforce in the high need jobs available for Vermont. We served over 500 English language learners last year. They come here with an American dream, with the desire to learn, integrate into their communities, and move into high need positions. We are their pathway to that dream. Low literacy is directly tied to crime, generational poverty, and even low health outcomes and high health costs. We are only asking another $225 per student, a number that on its face is small, but is profound in what we will, it will do for our students. Your investment in AEL can make that a reality. So thank you for allowing us to come and talk with you about this request, and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Sir Williams. Did you mention Broughton as being a part of the AEL? Yes. Okay. We have we have an appointment to meet with uh, Christy Torrey on Monday. Yes. Okay. So maybe you want to start with the same thing? Yes. Um, so the chair of appropriations can ask, and I'm sorry, I, I know I missed this, but why not wait until 2025, the next budget cycle? Well, so the reason we're here is yes, we came originally and asked for 1.5 million in order to make ourselves whole for this year. Mm -hmm. And we were said, we will give you 1 million, and then we would like to convene a study committee, which is what Martine referenced earlier, and then come back to us for the added 500,000. Um, Great. That, that's very, very helpful to remind us. One question, and I, I, I think it's just almost, I don't think it's a problem, but does anybody ever have a difficulty finding all of you? I, you know, it's such an incredible resource. I don't see signs. I don't see, you know, do people get there and how do they get there? Is it through their doctor's office? Is it through CCB? How do they, they definitely get there. That's and great. That's there huge. Faster and faster. I love that. It yeah. seems. Uh, could more get there? I'm sure they could. I'd great. love to have our name known more widely. But I'd say the primary place that we get, well, two primary places. Students or others who have been involved in our program in some way refer others, mm -hmm. and then schools. Um, we work very closely with the schools when they know somebody who's headed, they're just not doing well, they're headed out the door, mm -hmm. ready to drop out, they will be straight staring towards our learning centers and get yeah. involved early on there, work with them. Obviously, the best choice is for them to stay in the school if possible. But that doesn't work. And, you know, as much as we'd like to say that all the schools have great programs that support everybody, it's just not there. Yet. Not that, yeah. So, yeah, word of mouth is huge. Yeah. And that story of Wendy, she was at the local bank and was talking about how she was having trouble continuing working. And they said, you know, CAE is down the street. You should go down yeah. right. and talk with them. <laughs> are, you, are you tied in with the CTE schools? We work pretty close with them. Separate there are separate organizations, though. Yeah. yeah. We used to call them like like cars before. Right. Now they call them inside of it. Yes. And there's often confusion between the two. Right. Yeah. They they provide the technical training. We're more focused on the base skills. We'll work together sometimes around um, with students that need both. That happens quite commonly in our high school completion program. We'll identify some uh, CTE courses that will help a student move towards their learning goals, their career goals. So yeah. So we have a CTE bill, or mm -hmm. portions of it. Mm -hmm. Is this something we might think about adding to the CTE? It's a great question. Uh, Senator Kitch will want a recommendation in the next couple of days, so this would be done separately. Okay. Yeah, but it's a it's a but for this for this market. This is for the okay. yeah budget adjustment. Right. But yes, going forward, we can have conversations about yeah. collaboration yeah. and coordination. Yeah. Because a lot of times, uh, I know Stafford doesn't have no seats. 
So they've they've actually taken some of the high school and put them into the uh, into the night into the night portion mm -hmm. in yeah. two shifts. Now yeah. you answer my question. This conversation is really about the BAA, yeah. not about the Beethoven. Mm -hmm. um, how many high school students would you say you roughly have? Do you mean high school age? High school age, yeah. Kids that need something different or need some tutorial, something that they're not finding in their high school. Yeah. Or just extra. I think it varies by program. Yeah. We tend to have older students at CDP. Yeah, I mean, even Vermont Enough Learning serves seven of Vermont's counties from county to county, it varies. But I think the last time I looked, 16 to 18 year olds made up 20% of our population. Remember, right? I could get you the exact number. I would appreciate that. Yeah, that would be really yeah. helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming in. They, you do amazing work. Um, speaking of, to you in the third person, not good. You do great work. It's thank you so much. I would just maybe suggest to the committee that we hear the results of the task force because um, we did spend time throughout the summer working on this, and it'd be good to hear. Whether or not the task force itself would recommend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you think the task force would not recommend? I, I don't want to speak okay. whether the AOE was in trouble in that. So I would want to hear, you know, as many voices as possible. Who would be the best person? Yes, the parents. So okay. Hopefully she was the one who was working on the task force. That's good to know. So we will have to try to get Jess in tomorrow so that we can get case budget adjustments voted out as early as Friday, possibly. So I just think it'd be good. Yeah, to no, that's good to know. Bigger. Yeah. Do you think Felix just confirmed essential before budget adjustment? I do. Okay, good. No, that's all. That's all I need to hear. Yeah, that's great. Great. Senator Sheen. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for everything. Sounds like it was a productive summer also. Great. Good ones. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, committee, let's just take 10 minutes and we'll come back at 3 o'clock. Welcome back to <laughs> Senate Education. We are on Wednesday, January 31st. Senator Clarkson, please join us. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on your the genesis of S-282. Oh, I was hoping you'd kind of like give me the floor about my thoughts, period. Oh, on all sorts oh, of things. That would be Ooh. Is this low? Is this low? <laughs> you know, we like to keep our witnesses a little Intimidation lower than everyone else. Like I said. I mean, you like to <laughs> cut them down to size. Right. Is that what? Right. So it is a Allison Clarkson, Senator Windsor County District. It is an. an a joy to be back in Senate education. Room at the end of the hall right. where so many things can happen. Um, I, it is a pleasure to be back with you. It is exactly a week, as Beth and I were just saying, from when this uh, almost exact same bill was taken up in House education. And we, uh, I'm unclear which committee may be taking it up, whether House or Senate's gonna lead on this. But uh, it, I, I will. I don't think that decision's been made, so I feel comfortable in bringing it to you today. Right. Um, I understand the chair has kindly offered to have the students who are actually behind this bill come and speak to you with uh, their passion and interest in this subject. And it's an issue that's near and dear to this committee's heart. Just so you know, they're not speaking today. I know. Yeah, great. And point, invite, point, I think I said yeah. invited them to yeah. come, and yeah. they aren't. Yeah. There's no one under 20 in this room. Well, we have something in this room called Zoom, and that's where they would be, And but they are... Uh... Hi, if you're watching. Okay, so okay. I would do that because one of the young people, <laughs> yeah. one of the young people who has proposed this uh, is, in fact, our Senate page from Vermont to the United States Congress, and is, uh, Hudson Rainey is down in uh, Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, representing Vermont uh, in a place that needs a lot of Vermont values now. So this bill began with the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network meeting, and it's a robust group of young people around the state that have met, and they have brought to us uh, this, this bill. 
and uh, they're trying uh, to improve their school environment. Mm -hmm. They're trying to improve what is not working for them and what. <laughs> uh, so they spend, you know, as young people, they spend most of their week in school, and their environment is not a happy place for many of them. Uh, the purpose of uh, this proposed work is designed to shine a light on some of the ugly behavior that none of us may see, uh, but that is prevalent, uh, and to shine a light on behaviors which are hurting, which are hurting them. Uh, our students know best how the bullying and intimidation and racism are affecting them day to day. And so this bill enables uh, a, a year's pilot to examine uh, the school policies and to uh, make recommendations that after this year, uh, I think it's the end of 25, they would be rec making recommendations to their school districts and in fact to us about how to improve our school environments and make them safer, happier places for many of our students. I, I mean, we saw the headlines this summer. It was one after another, I felt, around this issue. Yeah, so we just got out there. And we've begun work on that. Yes. You know, we ha it, yeah. I'm not sure it's a work that's ever finished, but this uh, bill, and uh, this bill creates equity teams of, I think it's five people, uh, that that would you know it's teachers and students working together to examine the school environment in each one of those districts there will be five pilots around the state um, they've created a commission I'm, I'm not fully clear on why you need a commission but they will explain why uh, it creates a commission that would identify which what schools would be, or districts would be the pilots and uh, they uh, blah, 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 so five pilots Let's see. The equity teams will focus on anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion by reviewing equity-related policies and curriculum, and, will, and each one will receive uh, a stipend. Each of these pilot equity teams would get a, pi uh, a stipend of $10,000 each. Uh, the report is due back September of 25, um, and the commission which oversees the teams, would I guess coordinate the teams, coordinate their work, and would do the work of identifying which school districts got the teams. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -bum. That and that is it. The stipend is to help, uh, it's, it's a little, the stipend supports their work, and from what I can gather, it would, it would reimburse the teams for transportation, for food, for you know whatever costs, whatever uh, expertise or resources they needed. Um, you can explore all that and find out why they've said that. And so it's a five. The appropriation is five fifty thousand uh, dollars appropriated to the Office of Racial Equity, which would oversee. I uh, I understand this work, and the teams uh, are would be three students and two teachers, as I said, um, and I. That I am just a vehicle for helping put this in play. And uh, Hudson, I represent Hudson, who's uh, w one of their very articulate members, uh, as is, I believe, Abby is coming. Anyway, you'll, you'll have a, Abby, rather, you have a bunch of students who are passionate about this and who, who are really hoping to have a pilot statewide that can examine this in five different school districts and come back with some recommendations for us. So they, they're the ones that thought to 10,000, they thought the pilot, this is, this is their Yeah, this is okay. what they have explored and what we have enabled for them. Uh -huh. This Great. is, and this okay. is their recommendation, and this is the, uh, the, the recommendation of the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network, which is, you know, they'll tell you, how, I, I don't know how many, how big that network is. Yeah. I know it's good size. Questions? Some of you may know more than I. For Senator Clarkson on this. Oh, Senator Stewart, please. Thank you very much for bringing this to us. This is so exciting. Um, I have been known to say that we need to, you know, fix bullying and racism and other issues in schools, not by litigation necessarily, but by on the ground work, which I I really appreciate this. Um, so I hope we can make it make it go. Um, I'd love to see um, 
no, no, no. We'll, we, we can work with it, but I, maybe more conversation around bullying here. Um, also, um, just to just to throw this out there, we had something in the last school I worked at where, when there was a disciplinary action, um, it went to this sort of equity team to find out, um, you know, what the consequences were on the person who perpetrated the action and. Um, it was hard because of FERPA and privacy rules, but the students really wanted to know what happened and what the consequences were um, and how it impacted those that had been harmed. So it was almost like a restorative justice kind yeah. of thing. Um, so I'm wondering how, I'm also just wondering how restorative justice is going to play into so, this. So good question. Yeah. I would ask, I'd ask the kids. I think it's a work in progress. Yeah. And I think they're wanting to explore all those. All, all those things, and I, I, I think a lot of kids suck up and absorb some of the ugliness that they're dealt, and they need a mechanism for working, deal, addressing it, and 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 uh, I, I, I would ask them that. I love the idea of teachers and students working together on solving problems in their school districts. So, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's, on the ground, this is where the rubber meets the road with these kids in their environment, in their school districts, with their teachers, mm -hmm. trying to solve this problem one school at a time. That's great. Yeah. So anyway, I, I'm so grateful that you're willing to listen to them. And you may not go further with it, but I, I'm hoping you'll at least incorporate it in something that you're working on, because I think it's important work. Mm -hmm. And the, the 50000 likely general fund, ed fund? TBD. Okay. I think that's your job. It's technically not. I know, but I, mean, <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I think that's this committee's yes, to, yes. to figure out it. And I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think we specified. We, oh, we did. It's Ed Fund. It's General Fund. <laughs> it's the other thing. It's not the Transportation Fund. Thank you. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, at least I remember this $1,000. I got the 10000 Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. My goodness. Counselor. I don't even thank you, first of all. I don't Shows. even need to say anything. You washed through the bill. Oh, did I? Yes. Oh, now I've got to go back to the open meeting law. Goodbye. Good luck. And Terry, already once today, there's been executive session. Good to know. If I am, if anybody's interested, I am open to a motion to order this to lie permanently, but it's totally up to you. <laughs> Careful, it, you this right. <laughs> Please. That's St. James Office of Legislative Council. We are going to walk through S282, which um, the sponsor pretty much did already. There's a couple things we can point out. So the first thing I will um, say is this is a piece of session law. So this is a pilot project. So it's not going in your green books, but it still has the full force and effect of um, law. So it, this bill creates the uh, Education Equity Team Pilot Project to support work in schools um, by providing stipends to up to five supervisory unions or school districts to fund the work of equity teams. It creates the Equity Commission to oversee the pilot project that is composed of one student equity leader appointed by the governor, one representative from the Social Equity Caucus appointed by the chair of the caucus, the chair of the State Board of Education or designee, the director of the Office of Racial Equity or designee, and one member of the House Committee of Education appointed by the Speaker of the House. The commission um, has kind of two jobs here. One is to identify up to, up to five supervisory union or school districts to participate in the pilot project and to manage the stipends, um, but they also are to provide support to the equity teams um, created. The Office of Racial Equity is the state entity uh, designated to provide support to the commission. And then the commission um, is required to report back ne next September to you all on the work of the equity teams, including any recommendations for expansion of the pilot project. Um, and then there's language about how many meetings the commission needs to have, etc. On page three, line 10, subsection C, um, is the language about the equity teams themselves. So the commission is choosing which supervisory unions or school districts are going to participate, and then up to five, 
And then um, the, uh, let's see. Then the supervisory union and the school districts themselves are creating the equity teams on the ground. So the commission is picking the districts and then the districts are picking the people. The equity teams are going to focus on anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion by reviewing equity-related policies and curriculum. The teams have to include an equity coordinator or other school administrator, three students, and two teachers, and then again, the superintendent is appointing the team members, so not district super supervisory union level. As the sponsor mentioned, each team is entitled to a $10,000 stipend to support its work. The bill as drafted contemplates that stipend would be used for transportation reimbursement, food and supplies for meetings, and other resources to support the staff, or to support the work of the team, um, and it does require students to be reimbursed at the same rate as staff. And then the appropriation on page four is from the general fund for $50,000 to the Office of Racial Equity um, for those stipends, and the act would take effect on July 1, 2024. Yeah, please. Uh, just a question about the timing next se September 2025. So, does the report come out before the work of these groups or <coughs> after the work of these groups? And if it's after, then when are they going to be doing their things? Um, <clears throat> I mean, this contemplates that they're working this summer through the fall into the next school year. So the 2024-2025 school year. Okay. All right, thank you. Senator Sheen. Thank you. Um, so the, the idea of this is something I support a lot, but you know, I'm wondering if, you know, we, we heard from Amanda uh, just the other day, we got the report from the advisory working group and I was trying to read through it quickly, but is this at all duplicative of, of, of this report that we received and the, and the guidance, the recommendations that we, that are in here? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I also wonder if it's at all duplicative of the hazing, harassment, and bullying legislation. I don't know, but I, I mean, I, it's, yeah. No, I was going to say, it's something I'd, I'd definitely like to do and work yeah. on, but if we all, if we, have the if we have the recommendations that that help to address you know, equity and bullying and harassment issues and, and racism in schools, uh, you know we, we gave them a pretty big task and they put together a lot of information. So I think that um, it'd be good to maybe do like a side by side comparison of <coughs> this versus. Or this yes. Yes. Yeah. Is this maybe just this is a part of. You think that this yeah. one's a part of it? Yeah. I mean, it could be. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm wondering, too. And if it is, I'm all for it. But I, I'm just trying to be mindful in general of our bills and how sometimes um, we duplicate things. And, you know, it's fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love the idea also. I, I, I worry, I don't worry, I just worry, well, I do worry. The pilot we did for uh, wraparound schools good information, pilots, I just want to make sure that whatever happens, it actually goes out. Uh, I see Mr. Robinson over there. I don't know if, if other schools are picking that up. I look back and I don't know if I'm thinking, gosh, that was a good idea or that was a bad idea yet. Um, because we put a lot of money into it. This is not a lot of money. Some schools benefited from wraparound services. They got to try it out but we'll find out quickly if they're cutting all those services after two years. And what did we learn? What was the takeaway? This seems more but doable price-wise, and I guess I'd also be curious to know, and we can dig into this, what some of the schools are doing. There's definitely a problem out there. There's no question about it. Um, yeah, please. I think it might be uh, good to have Addie Lensner testify. She's she's in this report and from what we heard from Senator Clarkson it also sounds like she was involved 
in this uh, with the Vermont Students Against Racism. So well, yeah, I'm also it's, making it's a decision. mind, she's slated to come next week. Oh, yeah. Uh, if the committee's interested in digging into this a little bit more. The only other thing that I would say, and I'll talk to Peter Conlon about it, is it's an, I'm not sure if we're completely balanced in terms of who's starting with bills yet. Most of them are starting here. The House is doing school construction, but I'm not, I don't see their lift quite as heavy as ours, so it might be something that we ask the House to, to start with. What's that? I'm going to make a joke. School construction is not a heavy lift. That's no pun intended. Uh, but uh, what's going to come out of that, I frankly don't know if it's going to be nearly what we're going to be doing with literacy and CTEs and some of the other issues. So, Questions, comments? Comment. Comment. It's, it's important. It's very yeah. important. I think we all well, agree. Yeah. In, in the context of education, declining academic standing, uh, and programs and things we keep adding to our diminished uh, teacher population uh, in the funding, I think that we need to go back to the basics and start focusing on education. And if, you know, if you got a sports team and they're failing, you go back to back to the fundamentals, the basic fundamentals of uh, we need to do the same thing with reading and writing and arithmetic. That's my own personal opinion. I think we're getting our focus is too diluted. So I just have to say that. Yeah, no, and, and I think this is part of, I mean, certainly being in a school, we don't want any child in Vermont to feel unsafe, right. to be Absolutely. bullied, harassed, zero tolerance. Is this the best way to do it? I, I, I don't know. It could be one way to try out. Um, we may also ask people to try this in five schools without the $10,000 and come back and report. I noticed they to took us. it out of the general fund. They didn't take it out of the education fund, which were, you know, I think the 18.5% increase in education fund that they're talking about is, it really got some pushback from it myself. Yeah, I think I'm reading everybody wants to do something. The question is what might be the most effective way to do it. And if it's, if it's a, a repeat of the Act 1 working group, for sure. I think we'd rather spend $50,000 on adult education so people can get a trade. Um. Yeah, I mean, well, I think we all agree. We just want kids. We want kids. We saw a lot of headlines this summer where kids aren't feeling safe and good in schools. This is also a product of that feeling. How can we improve it? We've taken some steps, hazing, harassment, and bullying, mascot, bill, act one. It's, the work is going to continue. Is this the right approach? We'll find out. Maybe it's a different way to invest, I, I don't know. Yeah. And just a quick comment. Yeah. The, uh, like you were mentioning, going back to just focusing on the education itself, uh, I mean, I. My, my response would be, you know, if kids are dealing regularly with hazing, harassment, bullying, and racism, that's going to contribute to declining test scores. Um, I mean, I had to deal with it myself uh, in middle school, and it's, you know, the last thing I cared about was math, so. Yeah, it interrupts, and, uh, yeah. Uh, for sure. That's a really good point, I appreciate sharing. Yes, sir, Bill. I just wanted to echo what my colleague said. It's as if, from a teacher's perspective, it's really hard to teach when students are suffering, um, whether it's from hunger or abuse or bullying. It's you know, we know how the brain works, and if the information doesn't get in, if there's that block. And I mean, we've you know we heard this this morning in um, health and welfare that it seems as though somewhere in our society things aren't happening that, happening that need to happen. So if kids aren't learning to be kind at home, you know, the school has to step in and do the work of teaching kids to be kind and open. And, um, you know, the state is having to sort of um, help where some of this stuff isn't happening at home or wherever else it's supposed to help happen. 
Um, so I, and as with all due respect to my adult ed folks who are wonderful, if we get kids to learn appropriately when they're young, we won't need adult education. They're going to get what they need early on. Um, so I think investing early is really important as well. And our dropout rate, as you know, in Vermont is high. I mean, what we see this year, something like 25%, 30% in some districts, even higher. Please. No, I just wanted to comment. <coughs> uh, I understand the need for the research. I understand the need for the students and the faculty to get involved in the issue, but I don't think it, it's necessary to put a $50,000 against it. I think this is a great student council project. It's not, a, it's not something that needs to be legislated. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, we'll dig into it a little bit. We'll see if the House wants to start this process, see what they think. But, um, okay, all points taken. Important topic. Appreciate Thank Senator Clark's bringing it in. Mr. Fannin. S204, uh, and that's relating to reading assessment and intervention. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Morgan, you've got my testimony. It's being presented out right now. Got it. Okay. Um, so, S204. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, Jeff Fannin, Executive Director of Vermont NEA. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today about S204, which I refer to as a literacy bill. Um, we share your intention to ensure that every Vermont student knows how to read and improves their reading competencies. Uh, we have significant concerns with the bill, but if you think it necessary, we believe the bill needs to be amended to make sure it doesn't conflict with state policies and federal laws, um, to ensure it doesn't create redundancies in the school delivery system. <clears throat> and to assure that it doesn't impinge upon teachers' ability to teach all students how to read. Uh, you may see some similarities and consistencies with the AOE's Jess DeCarlos' testimony uh, that she gave to you a few weeks ago. Consistencies or inconsistencies? Consistencies. Consistencies. Okay. Yes. I'll get to that. Okay. Uh, which, you know, is an appreciation for her work, I'll say it that way. Um, education research is. Uh, an ongoing process and the profession continues to be informed by teachers in the field, neuroscientists in the laboratories as to what is the most effective teaching for all readers. It is ever evolving as it should be. Uh, the, this focus on reading is a robust debate in the profession and educators already continuously improve their practices based on solid research, but we don't uh, want to become beholden to one particular instructional practice because it happens to be particularly popular or touted by the press. For example, in 2007, the United Kingdom uh, went down the, the reading road and contemplated, that's contemplated by some here now. But a recent academic uh, examination of the results did not make a compelling case for adopting a phonics-only approach to teaching reading. Uh, and I'll give you a citation of that University of Bristol report in there and a link to it. Uh, indeed, the paper calls for scrapping the phonics approach adopted in 2007 for a more comprehensive alternative approach to teaching reading. Uh, while, the Vermont educators, uh, while Vermont educators are informed by research in the teaching of phonics, they're most effective when they take a comprehensive and flexible approach to literacy, literacy instruction. Um, Jess DeCarlos' January 19 written testimony is compelling and worthy of a reread. Uh, among other recommendations, she also stressed the importance of reviewing the good work of the Act 28 Advisory Council on Literacy, uh, their accomplishments, and its recommendations. There's a link to that report there. I think I have it, but just, just in case. Morgan, do they have that? Is that testimony that now? It should be ready. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, the council is comprised of, uh, among others, teachers who work in classrooms every day with students who present with a myriad of challenges and successes when it comes to reading. Teachers are the experts, and while they certainly can advance their craft, they teach our students with much success as compared to other states who adopted a one size fits all. Uh, one size it's all approach. For example, you heard about Mississippi's success on the NAEP scores of its fourth graders. However, the scores there are suspect for two reasons. First, Mississippi retains a great number of third grade students, um, which provides, and they provide significant resources to those early readers. That's a good thing. Uh, 
but it may have social emotional scars for students who are failed third grade. Um, second, the NAEP scores touted as demonstrating Mississippi's reading success in fourth grade dropped significantly by eighth grade. Uh, in other words, Mississippi's success was fleeting. Looking at the states that scored well throughout Massachusetts and New Jersey, it is worth noting that they don't mandate a one-size-only approach to reading. Uh, what teachers say they need most to teach all readers is flexibility. I heard that repeatedly and it makes sense. Each student brings different strengths to the classroom. Each student is different and different learners require different pathways to reading proficiency. Uh, teachers need flexibility and the resources to meet every child's unique needs and requiring a single approach for all students will necessarily fail some students. The science of teaching students to read is based on a large body of research that contains five interrelated components. All students need explicit instruct, instruction in the five essential components of reading. Phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and reading comprehension. While the bill mentions these five uh, components, S204 places too much emphasis on one aspect of the research, phonics, while minimizing the, the importance of others. However, the interconnectedness and interdependence of all the essential components cannot be overstated. That singular focus may harm certain students who may excel with different approaches to teaching them to read. If you move forward the bill, Vermont A.A. recommends you adopt the amendments to the bill that Jessica Carlos outlined in her testimony. Uh, additionally, Vermont A.A. believes the bill should include specific mention in ongoing appropriation for the Act 28 uh, Literacy Project Manager at the uh, House of the AOE. Um, yeah, pre sir, if you could have the part of the sure. uh, supporting the continuation of that person, is that what you're saying? Correct. I didn't say it well. It's, it's better stated in there, I think. Um, but we think the position is a good one. Um, <clears throat> previously, I have sat in this chair and criticized the agency for shortcomings that I saw. Uh, but I want to be clear. Given resources, as was the case with the Act 28 literacy position, the agency has served a vital role for literacy specialists, special educators, and regular education uh, classroom teachers throughout Vermont. Please maintain your support for that position. Uh, another general recommendation would be to increase resources for the AOE and school districts with which to collect literacy data. <clears throat> Locally obtained data guides curriculum, development, and instruction, thus making data a needed evidentiary resource for schools. The AOE and local education leaders need to be given resources to figure out a way to make local assessments valid and reliable for, for the state to utilize. At section 1D, which is proposed uh, Title 16, 2907D, the bill proposed to add a new statewide end of year assessment through statewide end of year assessments. It shall be given to intensive general education reading intervention immediately following the identification of the reading deficiency. Despite what the testing companies claim, statewide standardized tests are designed to assess a district's academic program and not to reach conclusions about individual students. Um, using a standardized statewide assessment to identify a reading deficiency in individual students lacks the efficacy of an assessment conducted by a trained classroom teacher. And at section 1E, the bill proposes to ban a specific instructional strategy and remove from the professional teacher reading, professional teacher's reading arsenal uh, a tool. That is exactly the type of directive teachers are saying they do not need or want. The flexibility to meet every student's needs is critical to teachers being able to succeed with students. Moreover, our position as to this specific issue is consistent with Vermont and EA's long-held position that curriculum matters should not be subject to legislative action. It's also a reminder that it's consistent with what VSBA said. I think Kara Zimmerman talked about that too. So that's my written testimony. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm by no means, and I'll say this outright, I'm not a reading expert. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, and when did you email us your testimony? I think around 3.15. Okay. Making some last Got it. Yeah, no, I apologize that no, it no, no, is no. not ready. Yeah. Um, Questions? Comments for Ms. Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah please. Um, thank you very much yeah. for that. A few questions slash comments. Um, so you seem to be in your testimony targeting reading instruction comprehensively, writ large, in schools? Uh, 
And so the, and I, the, I'm not sure, but and this bill yes. isn't doing that. This bill is is a targeted approach for students who are showing deficiencies early in school. So it's not retooling the way we teach reading, reading. necessarily across the board. Okay, uh, I don't. If you say so, that I, I understand what you're saying. What I what I, I did speak with several teachers about this, and 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 they were saying whether a kid is challenged or not. I need to bring every arsenal in my toolbox to the plate. And, and, and if you tie one of my hands behind my back, uh, whether it's a kid who's challenged or not challenged with reading, I'm then ch challenged in, in being effective with that student. So whether the, the child is suffering a deficiency or not, we want to bring everything we can to that, to that student. And I think that's what the teachers are saying to me. Okay, I just, it just seemed like you were talking about, it, it sounded as though you were suggesting that this bill is, is targeting the way we teach reading across the board, where to me that's not what this is. This is a, it, just a targeted approach for kids who are not, maybe not uh, excelling in second grade or first grade and need certain targeted approaches. I, I think that's and, right, the bill, but it, it is very prescriptive. Yes, it is. Yeah. About that. Yes. Thank and that's what I'm hearing yeah. folks are not, uh, don't think it's the best strategy for them to um, try to get all the students. Because the, the reading challenges may be varied. Right. Um, and they and they clearly are, uh, ju judging by the outcomes that we're seeing. Um, <clears throat> my other, is this a question, is I, I really respect the opinions of all the various organizations that weigh in on the fact that the legislature shouldn't get involved in curriculum and so on and so forth, and you have long-standing thoughts um, and stances on, on these things. At the same time, at what point do you draw a line in the sand and say, this is a crisis, we need to do something different? Um, I understand you, you want to hold to what works for your groups. I get that. Um, but I, I, I just want to, I guess I want to tap into our, is there room for creativity? Is there room for change? Is there room for um, some, you know, behavior that might uh, require some, some evolution? Right, and I, I, I talk about that. I mean, uh, okay, I don't, sorry. No, 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 no. Right. In earlier testimony, I talked about um, uh, it is an ever evolving process. And yes, teachers uh, do evolve, as do we all. Um, and I think that that's what they're saying is uh, we are making great strides. Act 28 was, was a good thing. That literacy position at the AOE was very helpful. That's really just getting going. Uh, I think somebody said the modules that the AOE has now have been out for four months. So I think the change you seek is out there and it's coming, but it's not yet uh, fully grounded and baked, but it's, it's, it's in progress. My only, thank you. My only other question is you, you're speaking for the they collective. Um, how many folks did you speak to when you're talking for teachers? How many? Because I've talked to teachers who have actually a very differing view, and it's sure. folks who read the Seven Days article. There were teachers in there who were saying, "I want to learn how to teach reading properly. I want to do the right thing." So I'm wondering, how many? Can you give us a sense of how many people? Um, I talked in the fall with people about this. I, I, I don't have a sense exactly. I didn't keep track, um, but it's yes. And I read the Seven Days article. I read other articles. I read and spent much of the weekend reviewing research on this. And so while an article is, is as deep as it goes, the research that I read was telling me we ought not to be going with one singular, singular approach. And we ought to be not emphasizing one approach to solving the reading challenges that students come with. Uh, and in fact, the, the research that I read said you want to bring everything. Uh, and whether a kid is, is challenged in one particular way uh, or others, it's better to have everything you possibly can have at the ready to use with that student. So that is what I did hear from teachers. Uh, I, I've, certainly the three on the, uh, uh, the council uh, were, were helpful, uh, as were other people. On the literacy council? The literacy council, I'm sorry. Um, and so, I, you know, what I'm hearing is we're getting there. We, we see a problem. We're trying to address it. Uh, the tools of you know, again, I, I've sat in this chair and been critical of the agency for what I saw as its shortcomings, 
And on this one, I think they're, they're starting to really hit their, their sweet spot. It's because of the resources were given to them to hire somebody who really has been helping the field. That's good. They used to do that a lot more, and that's not what we hear out of the agency of late. So that's a, a pleasant change, a good thing. Yes. Can I ask one more? Yeah, please, of course. Um, so how, so if, just hypothetically, if we were to do nothing, how long would you give the current system to start kicking in? When would we start seeing results from what we're doing now, i.e. the modules, for example? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a, I, I'm not sure anybody would have, be able to know. It's one of these things where, and talking about research is ongoing, and uh, we should be doing it. That's why I talked about data collection. We should be doing data collection so that we have a better understanding of where we are and where the kids are. Uh, I think that's a better approach because whether you did the bill or focus on one aspect or not, and not others, uh, we won't know until some year, some point down the future. And I think that's what you know the United Kingdom did was studied it. Uh, this professor did and said, "Hey, the stuff we tried in 2007 really hasn't shown any improvement." It's not, you know, so we sunk a lot of effort into this and it didn't pay off. Now the prior one didn't either, and that's why they changed in 2007. But it's still ever evolving, and I think we want to, don't want to pigeonhole ourselves into one particular approach. Correct, and we certainly don't want to use um, strategies that are harmful, which we know there are certain reading strategies that are actually harmful to kids, and I think they need to be removed from the repertoire. Anyway, right. I and I would say, you know, that. again, Mississippi, you know, had a great, a very high retention rate in third grade, and while that may up their scores, it may have caused other harm to those students in other ways down the road. And I ponder, what do you mean by that sentence? I, I think the way it's, yeah. So, so that's. Go ahead. Right. I think you know there is. Uh, I heard people talking. Moving on from third grade. Right. If you're, okay. you know, if you're held back in third yeah. grade, yeah. You failed or whatever the yeah. term yeah. you want to yeah. use, and your classmates are going up. Fourth, you probably still have recess together. You probably still have lunch together, and other yes. things of that sort. And uh, Jeff is now suddenly a third grader still. Right. And the the scars of that being held back issue are are, are real. Are real. Yeah. Absolutely. We talked about you know no a few question. minutes ago talking about hazing, harassing, no bullying. These are no these question. are social stigmas that we don't no that don't yeah. typically help kids. I'll say it that way. So should we work with them to get them to, to a better place of reading? Absolutely. But I you know Mississippi is akin to the Houston miracle that we heard about many years ago, and they're testing where they just held back kids, and, and a, you know that that was the solution. That's all they did. They didn't. But Mississippi, to their credit, did provide resources, but only at those early grades. And by eighth grade, whatever gains they had were lost. And Vermont is what top three or four, I think, in reading by eighth grade. So I, well, there are concerns at the early grade, no question about it. But and by the eighth grade, we're doing really well. If you just want to take one score on the NAEP. Uh, which is, just takes a sample of kids. It's not comprehensive, and, uh, but it is a, a comprehensive exam. And I, I, I don't have it, but I know of the NAEP, it's very, um, it's more than just reading. It's a comprehensive reading comprehension exam. Uh, much different than sort of, can I read these 10 words? That's not, what, that's not at all what the NAEP is about. I do appreciate what you said, though, about the, the seven days, one piece, I want us to be thoughtful. You know, I, I personally took issue with some of the things in it that were left out. Important piece for sure, but I don't want us always uh, to respond to news articles per se. I mean, it's good to get the conversation going, but I appreciate it. Senator Weeks and then just. Yeah, um, I appreciate your, your uh, testimony. Um, one, of the, one of the comments that you made really resonated, and that's that in the evaluation of readers, we should be looking, uh, we should be concerned about the performance of the individual reader right. versus the performance of the district. I get that. So uh, just curious if, if you can characterize the current reading performance testing, whether we're really focusing on the student or focusing on the district, because I really don't know. And I'm, I'm curious of your feedback. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I know the answer, but I, I, that, that answer may vary depending on the school district, right? And so some schools may be focused on the exam. And okay, but we're not. There's not a standardized uh, test requirement for districts across the state. Right? Like, um, we, that, that's what I'm asking. Are we focusing yeah. on the student? Are we focusing on the district? 
that, I, we, I we do have. I'm not trying to set you up. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, um, I'm trying to think of No Child Left Behind, Every Student Succeeds Act. There are other, other acts that require certain measures to be taken. And, and for the life of me, I apologize, I'm drawing a blank on this one. So I, I can get back to you on that. Thank you. I just want to stand up for myself. My comments about seven days were simply with regard to the teachers' comments, the teachers who spoke in the article about the harm that they saw within the current system. So it was, I, I was just talking about the testimony of the teachers, not necessarily referring to the veracity of the reporting or the data in the article, just FYI. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to say was that I, I do think it's important if you're going to start talking about harm done by holding kids back, um, that the harm done uh, uh, of you know that illiteracy does to, to kids that is quantified and we have a ton of data on that I don't know if there's a lot of data on the harm or the stigma around being held back but if there is I'd love to see it yeah because it'd be interesting to compare the two fair enough and I'm not I'm not disputing at all that uh, kids who can't read do suffer harm that uh, that's without uh, argument uh, I and, and I start there you know we, we share your goal of, of making sure all kids read that is the priority, um, and, and so. Please, I don't know uh, the answer, so I'll ask the question. How many, do we know, do we have statistics on how many people, how many students are actually kept back a grade for 2022? I don't, I don't know if the agency collects that. I don't know if schools collect it. I know that uh, what I hear is we don't like to hold kids back in Vermont. Uh, it's not true in other states. Obviously, Mississippi has a high rate. They, they also have corporal punishment in Mississippi. I don't think we, we're looking to do that either. Um, so I, I think the consensus in this state is, for very serious reasons, you might want to hold a child back. But I think it's probably a last, a re, it's a last resort. And I, I, to Senator Kulik's question or comment about uh, the harm holding back a student is versus reading. Um, it, it, we want to make sure that if you're going to advance a child, even though they have challenges, that they get the attention they need and the help they need to become a better reader. Mm -hmm. So whether it's in third or fourth grade, that's what we want to do. <coughs> Great. Yes. I just do think it's important to, and then we've talked about this before in here, but that shift that happens after third grade, where you're going from learning to read to using reading to learn, I just think it's important to, that's why that line is so important. Right. And, and I, I, some of the research, and I didn't go down this rabbit hole because there's a lot of research out there on all this, but uh, one of the pieces I saw was kindergarten teachers, and the quality of a kindergarten teacher is uh, predictive of yeah. success in third grade. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah. You know, you can really drill down in the data and get lost. And there's uh, one, in the, the University of Bristol report, he talked about 11,000 news articles on reading, and, and some I don't forget the period. So there, there's an enormous amount of energy and uh, interest in making sure that students read, and nobody doubts that. Don't go far, Mr. Fisher. You're up next. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Five minutes, uh, maybe less. Okay. Go ahead. I'll, I'll look at the Bristol report because I'm anxious to do that, but I, it would be interesting to see what the teacher prep situation was in that case, like what kind of preparation the teachers had, because it sounds like it wasn't very successful. In Bristol? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, uh, there was a University of Bristol professor who looked at the entire, they have a, a much different education system. Right, um, yeah. My brother-in-law taught there for a bunch of years mm -hmm. in a public school, um, and they do very much focus on test mm -hmm. taking and focus on that. Um, and so it is, it's a different approach altogether. Uh, and your point about teaching prep is, is equally important. But what we might teach them today might be different 10 years from now. And that probably is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to switch uh, literacy conversations uh, with Mr. Fisher, but I do, can we just take two minutes, a uh, quick two minutes? I need to uh, stop down the hall. And welcome back to Senate Education, Wednesday, January 31st, 3.55. Our last <coughs> bit of business continues on the literacy front. 
Uh, senators will recall that uh, Secretary uh, Boucher was with the committee last week over Zoom. Going through the uh, agency's bill, uh, which now will likely be a committee bill or attached to Senator Bulick's work, and you had a number of different recommendations, and uh, those are the recommendations that we are about to review and hear about. Excellent. Um, and why don't you start going through them while Morgan goes and picks it up? Awesome. Um, thank you for the record, Ted Fisher of my Agency of Education. I'm the agency's uh, Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs, and I'm sort of deputizing for Interim Secretary Boucher, who is um, dealing with uh, some, some family things going on, so we appreciate your patience yes. with us swapping out some witnesses here. Um, and also, uh, I just want to firstly say that we greatly appreciate the committee's interest in this topic, and we've been really appreciating all of the conversation and the multiple bills that you're considering, um, and your commitment to making meaningful strides this year and improving literacy outcomes. We appreciate you introducing and taking this bill. Um, as I think you heard last week from the Secretary and some of my colleagues, um, some additional work and review has occurred at the agency over the last several months, and as we review the, the, the final draft of our policy recommendations that were transmitted to law, we had some changes we wanted to make. So my goal today is just to walk through those changes, and I know Morgan will be back rapidly with the, the language, but I thought I would just maybe do wave tops, and then we can dive in as, as you have a chance to look at it in front of you. So um, really today we're only bringing feedback on three sections. No, fee no feedback on the findings, we agree, those are, those are all good. Um, we did want to make what I will characterize as some adjustments to section two, which is the mandatory completion of literacy modules. Um, some tweaks to allow the AOE and educators more flexibility to fully achieve implementation of the training, and there's one pretty consequential change. Some of them are, some of these are language changes, and some of these are more consequential changes, and I'll try to signpost those where they are. In this, in this section, there's one consequential change. Um, at one point during my editing process, everything was underlined, because if you look at your bill, you have all new, you know, your usual underlying process that Beth has given you for an all new section of law, and it was just underlined in bold and italics, and so I just stopped, because I realized it's all, all the sections we're, um, we're proposing to change are all new sections that you have under consideration in this bill. So with the committee's forgiveness, and you'll see that what I'm talking about in a second when you get the, um, the, uh, the, um, the paper copies, I have bolded and italicized strike throughs and additions um, but I've removed all the underlining, just, I think, to aid readability. But this is all still new sections of law, um, but we've only marked, um, you know, visually indicated what we're proposing to change from what is currently in the bill. And just to expect, so what was, I mean, you all contacted me this summer mm -hmm. to put the bill in. What sort of transpired between then and now around just general changes and things that you Yeah, so some of it, one is, one of the other sections I'll get to in a second, um, is a pretty big, I think there, we were hoping to do something consequential to rulemaking later in section four and section three, and we thought we were gonna do it the right way, and we made an, essentially an error of, of trying to be expeditious to get this in for the drafting deadline, um, and it was in a way that wasn't gonna work. So that is uh, partially an error, and partially we actually think what we've come up with now is just better. Um, this first section is just, um, as we've had a chance to look at the final legislative language from our proposal through legislative council, and we have a couple of tweaks. So um, we have, um, we're proposing in section A of, uh, subsection A of section two to, um, oh, actually, while you're still waiting for the copies, one of the things that we really struggled to do this year and is a lesson learned for me in terms of our internal policy development is that we didn't do a good job of identifying effective dates. And we, um, the devil is really in the details for us on, a, on effective dates or deadlines. And so um, in, in a lot of cases, Beth, and I, I really have to appreciate her, she just used her best, best judgment because in some cases, what we pro provided to her didn't have an effective date. And so she did a good job of trying to map it. But in most cases, we're asking for more time. And it's a little awkward for me to sit here and say, we're asking for more time at the same time as we're saying we want to move quickly. <laughs> um, but, but with some of these instances where there are review processes, and particularly when you get into questions of rulemaking, we just, there just needs to be a timeline. 
Um, and one of the constructs in terms of how we do rulemaking, which is I think our most consequential change, and at this point I'm kind of vamping for Morgan to get back, but um, um, one of our most consequential changes is, is because is literally because we think it will be more efficient to do it the way we're proposing to you today and quicker um, than if we went through a more protracted rulemaking process. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Are we talking about 204? We're talking about 281. 281. So section two is a mandatory completion of literacy modules. Essentially what this requires is um, that uh, it requires Vermont educators to um, complete some professional learning on literacy. Um, when we originally wrote this section, we the agency has contracted for and through other previous literacy work has contracted for and developed literacy modules. So the thought initially in this was, let's make sure everyone, let's actually like make sure everyone goes and does this um, so that all educators have a common baseline. Um, we are doing two things to this section. One is we're, sugge we're suggesting that we kick out the requirement one year. So instead of January 1 of 25, which will be about six months after bill passage, we're, 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 we're going to require January 1 of 26. So we're talking um, a, 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 an academic year and a half for all educators to come into compliance with this. So I'm at the bottom of page one. Um, so you have a date change in the first line of sub A. You have a, um, a language tweak currently to professionally licensed from our educators. And then on the last line of that page, you have um, I'm just going to read program of professional learning on evidence-based literacy instruction developed and offered, and then we propose adding or approved by the Vermont Agency of Education. And this is an important change, which is that um, what we don't want to do is make educators who might be very skilled and undertaken a lot of professional learning on literacy um, to do more professional learning if they don't have to. So if you have, if you as an educator have completed professional learning on literacy, you have the opportunity to go to the AOE, to our licensing folks, and say, have like do, does what I've already done meet the requirement, and we can then go and, and do it. So it will give us some flexibility. It'll also give the agent, the um, educator, some flexibility um, to meet that requirement. So that's an important change that we think is is very important, and you will see this construct of developed and offered or approved by the Vermont Agency of Education a couple times in this section. So if you flip the page and look at subsection B, e, you'll see the same. And you'll note that new licensed educators employed in Vermont will have completed this and then we just say with it instead of within we suggest by the end of um, we, in sub C we have a, um, a small addition to Vermont public and approved independent schools who pro employ professionally licensed Vermont educators this is a nod to independent schools many of whom do employ Vermont professionally licensed Vermont educators it's important to, to be clear that if you're an independent school who's pulling a licensed Vermont educator you need to um, meet this requirement as well. Um, and then we um, have added a, a section, uh, a, a line to the end of sub C to say that the agency shall provide a format for record keeping, including the use of the state licensing system as appropriate. Um, I have some educators and, and, and uh, folks from the NEA in the room who may have direct experience. I have some direct experience with the educator licensing system, which is quite antiquated, and the AOE is in the process of updating. We may be able to add this into the system for a future educator licensing system, which will allow us to maybe you know automate some of that record keeping. So that's just there to essentially flag that there. Educators shall provide evidence of required literacy professional learning upon completion of the educator's license renewal, and that is um, that is just a nod to the fact that we're not requiring a specific program that AOE has developed, but there's the option for educators who may, may have done a different set, a different type of professional learning that is acceptable to the agency um, to provide that evidence. So that's that's a conforming change, but it is a like a, a little bit of a significant language tweak there. And then we are proposing to add uh, sub E by the September of this year. AOE will develop and distribute 
reviewed a list of literacy professional learning requirements specific to each licensing endorsement. So this is going to give um, some more information to educators about sort of what might help them meet this requirement. So that's section two. Any, I'll, I mean, I'll just pause there for questions, comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So you first see that every licensing endorsement will have a, a, a literacy component? That's the goal is to have all educators, right. and I, I don't think that, I don't think this is changing that. But I think it does recognize that you have we have some very highly skilled literacy educators who are highly skilled in literacy by dint of their endorsement, or perhaps not. But um, but it is it is an, an acknowledgement of that. But yes, every Vermont the goal is still that every Vermont educator has a, has a baseline, I guess. And you think it's realistic for this work to be done by this September? Um, I believe so. That that's what my understanding is from our licensing folks. That this was their one of their recommendations. It does seem ambitious. Yeah. I'm happy to double to double check Please. if you'd like me to. Section three. Okay, so this is where I'm going to talk very briefly, and then I'm actually going to skip to section four for reasons that will become um, become uh, apparent. So, as I mentioned um, earlier, as we were going through the process, we wanted to ensure um, the the goal of sections three and sections four in our original work was to make sure that we are updating the educator prep program regulations to ensure that our educator <coughs> prep programs in Vermont are adequately teaching literacy um, and making sure that every educator who graduates from Vermont educator preparation program has a, a baseline grounding in, in, uh, in evidence-based literacy instruction and comes into the system with that sort of understanding. And that report came out of Act 28, correct? And that is how we've identified, and I think Senator Kulik, you asked the question when the new chancellor was here, the state colleges, why the state colleges were using a method that, I think a whole language method or something in teaching yes. literacy. Yeah, those so then those what happens questions. now? I mean, so, the chancellor's coming back in to have this conversation with us. She's really interested in literacy. But so let, what's the agency, the, one second, oh, what's the agency's role in this now in terms of enforcement and follow through? Awesome. Um, so here's where the oopsie is. The original version of this bill had all of the educator licensing regulations being transferred for the standards board for professional education educators to the agency, mm -hmm. which was not the intent. The intent originally, the, the original thinking on the NIOA's part was we'd like to take over regulation of just the, what we call the ROPA rules or the educator preparation rules because we don't use ROPA in statute. Um, so we wanted to take over just that section so there's a small problem, which is that there is one series of rules that, this, that the standards board, or I'm going to just use the term VSBPE, ably stewards, and they're very efficient at it. They have a good process. The AOE supports them, similar to the way we support the state board. Um, and um, however, their educator preparation rules are not, it's not a separate rule series. It's not very contiguous. It's kind of commingled within of the broader set of rules. And so we did not want to change other educator licensing requirements or rulemaking authority. And so the way this originally was, was a larger shift than we wanted. Um, we discussed ways to sh essentially ask you to direct us to take over that um, educator prep rulemaking, which would probably have required you to direct the standards board to update their rules at the same time as AOE established a new rule series. Um, so that we could tease them apart. Rulemaking is a complex process even when it's done quickly and ably. And so what we were thinking, what we kind of realized as we were um, as we were preparing for testimony is we would be doing that for a year, two years instead of moving quickly on this. So what we're bringing to you today, this is where it would be helpful to go to the last page, page three. You will notice that section four we'd like to just strike. So that was the section of the bill that transferred the rulemaking authority um, from the standards board to the um, to the agency. We are going to 
move away from the idea of rulemaking and just work with the standards board to bring our requirements through through their rulemaking process. <coughs> so jumping back now to page two, the edits to this section um, are basically as follows. Instead of having AOE conduct a review of the results-oriented program approval, ROPA program to strengthen educator preparation programs, which is what the uh, teaching of evidence-based literacy practices, which is what the original language says, we have an honor before July 1 of 25, the Agency of Education shall submit recommendations to the Standards Board for Professional Educators on how to strengthen educator preparation programs, teaching of, of evidence-based literacy practices. The agency shall also simultaneously communicate its recommendations to Vermont's educator preparations programs. That second sentence, so the goal is we're going to do a review and we're going to make the recommendations to the standards board. That last sentence is important, but I'm going to come back to it. If we jump to sub B, you will see that instead of requiring a certification of compliance, which was what sub B originally required, um, we have an honor before July 1 of 26. The VSBPE shall consider and as appropriate update educator preparation requirements in Rule Series 500. So that would mean that updates made based on the agency's recommendations would be ready um, for the fall of the school year um, of the fall of 26. Um, we're striking sub C because we don't need to adopt rules if the rulemaking construct isn't changing. Um, and then we have a, as part of its review under subsection A of this section. The agency shall recommend to the standards board whether or not additional mandatory examination is needed to assess candidates for educator licensure, skills in mathematics and English language arts fundamentals um, beyond the current requirements of Rule Series 500. So we're, we had originally that we would develop an additional examination. Instead, what we're going to be doing is reviewing the current um, praxis examinations required under, under the standards board's rules to determine whether they um, are sufficient to judge literacy and numeracy. So that's hope we will see and make that recommendation to the board. The board has the authority to require an update, so they will, it will kind of keep us in the same plane field. Right now, all of the praxis examinations are in rule and not in statute, so it would be kind of awkward if you guys were requiring one, not the other. So um, we are proposing to use the current process, basically. If you'll for, for, permit me, Mr. Chair, I just want to come back to A, to that last sentence. Um, we are uh, asking that you require us to simultaneously communicate our recommendations to the programs um, in order that they have an, essentially an additional time while remote looking is ongoing to start doing the work. It's our hope that you know a lot of them have really expressed a lot of interest in partnering with us on this. It's our hope that if we communicate our recommendations to them, they might start making some changes. Um, or looking at their programs to see where recommendations might be helpful in a voluntary basis before, as the rulemaking process is ongoing. So that's an important key thing we would like to see there. So some surgery. We will make sure that Beth has this language as well. Appreciate you, you, you buckling up and riding with me on that. Wow. I need to read this when I'm a little more yeah, lucid at a, at a different time of day. Yeah. 4.15 after six, seven hours of Testimony. But this is this is what we exactly what we <laughs> asked for, and it's a yes. great summary Thank and review you. and points that the secretary put forward last week. Uh, it's very very helpful. Appreciate it. Yeah. You can do all that. We can do all that. Yeah. Any, our, it seems like our goes. direct our director of educator licensing is already starting to do it based on how furiously he was typing earlier. So Senator he might be mad at me. So I'm going to backtrack to mm -hmm. earlier testimony for our NEA colleague, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bannon. So the caution was, and I think the caution might have actually came from the earlier bill's sponsor as well, a different topic, was um, complications of teaching one method. Mm -hmm. And I'm just cautious about falling into that same trap. Uh, I don't know these modules. I've never seen one, I've never taken one, but you know, being that there's one set of modules, is, uh, uh, is there a danger in, in following that path with this particular topic? 
this might not be your area. Yeah. Well, I was just, just well, well, I was about to leader. say, and I, I will, I will answer the question. Um, as long colleagues as much smarter than yeah. I have, and then I am, are attentive to this in terms of developing the modules. We aren't, and you will probably hear from <clears> others <throat> who will suggest that you adopt a certain standard or a certain program. And that's not what AOE is doing, that's not what AOE is asking, and that's not what our literacy modules do. We are also leaving this language gives more space for that. We, we have the option to, in the future, update those modules or update our requirements and courses as we get more information or as the science updates or things like that. You also have the opportunity if, if it meets AOE standards for rigor and evidence-based, if you've taken another professional learning um, course, that's yeah, fine. I, I acknowledge that. Yeah, that's, that stood out, yeah. and that's a good thing. I'm just, you know, here we're teaching teachers, and again, you know, again, I'm, it's not my, not my area of expertise either, but, you know, I just want to confidence the fact that if we're mandating modules, that by God, you know, that everybody puts their hand up that says, yep, yeah, this is the path we're, and we're going. Because it sounds like there's a sensitivity about previous endeavors that didn't have the results, the intended results. I appreciate your sensitivity to that because, as we know, amending statute can sometimes be a lengthy process. So by not having it be in statute and have it being referenced, it gives us the opportunity to be flexible as things develop. And uh, before you jump in, Senator Buick, we've asked the agency for a module to show us. Can you follow up with that? We've asked Absolutely. a couple of times. I think it'd be great for us to throw it up on the screen um, and have a look at it with somebody taking us through how a teacher will learn it. And Morgan, will you make that happen next week? That would be great. Senator Dueller. The only other thing I wanted to say was, like, I've said that eight times today. The only other thing I have to say, this is really the last thing. Um, in response to um, what you just referenced, which was um, Mr. Fannin's testimony, when I look back at the edits that were sent to me on, on this bill, um, uh, which 20, bill? 204, yep. um, around phonetic instruction, actually, that is still the focus. And so this is coming from Jessica Carolus, and her focus is still very heavy on phonics and, and phonetic awareness. Phonetic awareness is A, B is letter naming, letter sound correspondence, real and non-word reading. These are all around phonics. So I, I just want to say that shh, this is her recommendation. So okay. okay. Yeah. And like you mentioned to me, Senator Gulick is going to have some time with us tomorrow. If, it's, if it feels good for us to start to pull apart your bill at, not pull apart, but you know, edit, sure. you know, write up, no, no just uh, mark up a little bit, S stage one. Yeah. Uh, Senator Weeks, do you ever hear no, that? No, that no, 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 it's just a gesture. <laughs> Long day, a lot of stuff. Thank I need to end the committee there. Thank you. Morgan, you can take us off. Thank you, committee.